my honor and my pleasure to introduce Sass Carey, which is probably one of the most famous people in Madison County. <laughs> Sass Carey has a calling to support and document the traditional Mongolian nomadic lifestyle. She first went to Mongolia in 1994 as a nurse with the American Holistic Nurses Association and was captivated and has returned many times since then. We are fortunate to have her here to share with us her precious and sacred experiences with these people and their way of life. So please welcome her. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'd like to, we're going to talk about how nomads live in Mongolia today. And I'm a person who sort of um, puts you right in the middle of something instead of giving you a lot of context. but. Be sure to ask questions if you have questions. I, um, so I'm just going to start with this. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about two different groups today of nomads. One group lives in the very northern part of Mongolia in the taiga. Those are the reindeer herders, or the duha reindeer herders. And um, they live in a, a climate that's really pretty cold and wet. And the other group is the Gobi people. Uh, Gobi Desert people, and they live in the very southern part of Mongolia, right bordering China. The northern ones border Russia. And that's probably as much context as I ever give anyone. So there you go. <laughs> so um, it's all, always been about earth and spirit and medicine. And um, this is a, a painting that some artists made in Mongolia. And this gives you a sense of where, where I work. Uh, most I work mostly in the northern part, where it's a little darker. That's where the reindeer herders live. It's kind of near Lake Baikal, and the southern part in the Gobi Desert. So, in uh, 2000, I made a movie in the in the Gobi. Uh, it no, what was it? Yeah, 2001, two, three, four. I made a movie called Gobi Women's Song. Then I made a number of movies up with the rain, where the reindeer herders because they were so fascinating. And then um, I made uh, an, another one uh, just before COVID up with the reindeer herders. Then and also the same year we shot one in the Gobi. So here's the area in the taiga where very. <coughs> Uh, northern part. Okay, so this is uh, Selenga, one of the reindeer herder in the reindeer herder families. She she has a great story because she grew up as a reindeer herder, and she has the most fantastic voice you can imagine. I have some of her voice in my movies, and uh, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting story because one year we decided to give scholarship, scholarships to some students and she ended up getting one. But it's such a big difference to go from her living in a, a, a teepee or orts to the city of Ulaanbaatar, which is 1.5 million people, that she basically plunked out and got pregnant and you know all that stuff. And, but then um, she came back and she, she decided to go to a different school. She went to a school for, to be a musician, and she went to a different school, to a teacher's college, to, be, to teach music. And now she's a teacher in, in the country, with, uh, in the, the countryside of Mongolia. So that's one of my success, I feel successful about my interaction with her, although it was a little risky in the middle there. I started a nonprofit called Nomadic Care to preserve the Mongolian traditional nomadic culture through health films and stories. And here's what a settlement looks like in the north. And it's very green, you can see. They have a lot of mountains, which you can't see in this picture. But they, the East Taiga, there's an East Taiga and a West Taiga settlement. The East Taiga settlement, the, they live fairly close to each other like this. And the West Taiga, 
they only have two or three uh, families in, in one area, and then you have to like ride a reindeer a couple hours to get to the other one. So this is also the East Taiga. This is the settlement right near Russia. These are the Soyan Mountains bordering Russia. And this is sort of the evening when they've brought all the reindeer back from the pasture. This is called an Awa, a spiritual mound. All these are prayer flags. Um, and usually the Awas are at the top of a mountain this is at the top of a mountain just when you're going up to the taiga. It has uh, a lot of different awas like this, and each person brings a prayer flag to make a request or honor something. So here we are. This is how it is. We're riding the horse. This is, let's see if I can find the pointer here. No. Okay. Anyway, I'm sort of in the middle of the one with the helmet on. And um, it's very mm, challenging ride. Eight hours on horse to get uh -oh. to the settlement. And this is an easy place, otherwise you couldn't take a picture, let's face it. So then we had to get off the horse at a certain place and walk down the hill because the hill was too steep to ride down. So, um, on the left, we have uh, <coughs> Lauka. He's the wrangler, his son, who's now totally grown up. And on the right is my camera person, uh, Batoyer. And that's me in my Mongolian garb with a helmet. <laughs> I'm trying to teach him, but. <laughs> so here's what our settlement looks like when we get up there. Um, they live in teepees or orts, Siberian teepee. And we stay in our tents. And this is one day, it started raining, and I went into my tent, and the kids all had to check out what I was doing. <laughs> and they have satellite dishes now. They have TVs in there. Um, they love to watch Korean soap operas. They have electricity? Power? Yeah. They have solar panels. Solar panel power? I, I, I don't know if you can, I guess you can't see it. Maybe there will be a picture where you, you can see a solar panel. When we went up and made movies, we had to carry a solar panel. We had a big solar panel about this big that we took up on the horses. And um, Fred Thodel, who some of you may know, um, was cameraman of one movie. And he was constantly downloading in his tent and trying to have enough electricity from the solar panel and also um, charging batteries to use for the camera, so it was a little tricky. This is Gamba. He, he's just bringing his reindeer in from the pasture in the evening to stake them. This is Honda. She taught me how to milk a reindeer. I wasn't very good at it. And this is July 8th, snowstorm. We got that much snow. It was a cold day. This is also Honda, she's one of my favorites, and her cousin, or her niece, um, BG. Anyway, this is how they cook in the, in the orts. Um, you see the, on the right you see the stove, which is in the very middle of it. And um, they basically do everything sitting down or kneeling down. The uh, setup of the orts, and this is the same as the gear in the Gobi and all over Mongolia, is you orient yourself facing out of the gear, out the door, and the door always faces south. So the same word for right is the word for west, and the word for left is east, okay? And then there's north. So everything is oriented that way. And on the east side is the woman's side, and that's the kitchen. This is very gender specific um, because there's so, I sort of get it because there's so many things that have to be done and somebody knows how to just does that thing. The men usually are doing the work outside with the animals um, and the women are usually making the food and taking care of the children but they also do the milking of the reindeer. So the right side is the men's side. That's the saddles and all things relating to the animals and the north side is the sacred side that so for the shamans they have 
uh, an altar there, and for regular, uh, in the Gobi, they have pictures of the family in that area. So this is the center. There's so many taboos related to all this. You don't touch the fire, you don't throw garbage in the fire, um, you don't put your feet up facing anyone or the fire, um, even though you sleep in there. Um, you can see the strainer, that's for straining the milk. And this is uh, how they make bread. They make, I think I skipped one, yeah. This is how they make bread on their stove. It's sourdough, it's really delicious bread. And this is, then they turn it over and that's what it looks like. Yes. Yeah. Well, how large are these? They're about uh, 20 feet. The diameter. Yeah, from the bottom. But you know, you can't really stand up in a lot of it. So you put all the clothes and all the, everything around the outside. And then in, in the center is the, the stove and you have this little area around that where you sit and interact with people. Um, so at night, you, you put the bedding in along the floor, the ground, and closer to the stove. Yes? Well, what is their fuel for the stove? They, they have wood in the, in the Gobi, even though you might not see it. Uh, no, in, I mean in the taiga they have wood. Um, I think I have a picture of showing them bringing him back on, on reindeer. Um, in the Gobi, they use dung. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we aren't at the Gobi yet, but just want to show you both. This is a shaman. Um, they do believe in shamanism, and usually each family has their own shaman, and they, they work on the health of the animals and the people and the crop. Oh, not they don't have crops, but the land. Um, this is shaman, consort, and uh, this is, these are just some uh, people in, this was quite a long, long time ago, maybe 2004, when I started taking vitamins to the um, kids and the families, and this was the first time we did the vitamins, we're still doing vitamins, we take them every year to the whole, all the reindeer herders, which are about 300 reindeer herders. And, so these kids are all growing up now. And then uh, for seven years I did a health database to see what they needed and uh, Tserva and um, Baya and, <coughs> oh wait, oh, that one didn't go, there we go. And um, you can see the land, it's really hard to walk around, it's hard to ride. Reindeer, it's much easier to ride reindeer than horses because they call the reindeer jeeps of the taiga because they can go anywhere. They can ride here. Um, this woman in the middle, although she's a nomadic herder, is a, oh, Atwa, uh, she She's allergic to sun. So she always has gloves on and a hat and covers and, yeah. Um, this was quite a while ago. The person in the middle is was a really famous shaman in Mongolia, and Honda again, his uh, niece. And here's Honda again. See, there's her television. They have batteries that are charged by the solar panels, and you can see there are things around the outside. And often there's a, a trunk or something where they carry their clothes and, and other items. This is a, a, a hygiene kit that we usually take every time we take a little bit different things. We take soap and toothbrushes and floss and we did we took floss for a while then we gave it up. Um, I'll show you the floss in a minute but here we are giving that and toothbrushes. Okay so I was teaching the kids how to floss but then, about a year later, I realized that none of the adults had too close, two teeth next to each other. So I sort of stopped that, but as they weren't really using it. So here's how beautiful the land is, and more. This is um, a, a, a sort of relief map of where we rode the reindeer. Uh, when we went on the, my, did a movie called Migration, 
this movie. And we went on uh, the migration with them from the spring camp to summer camp. It was a two-day trip on reindeer, and it went over, as you can see, some really high mountains, Agal, um, Agal, and Argal. And uh, we, the summer camp is Maine Bully, and we started at Shamak, that's the spring camp. So that was the migration, and um, we went on that. It snowed, it rained, it sleeted, everything. So here's a family that's migrating. You can see the stove, um, the, the big pan they use. Oh, I'm not, I guess I'm one ahead of you or something. Okay, here they are uh, migrating, and they, that's uh, one family and her, two sisters with the two kids who are later in my, they're, these are in my movie quite a bit. What? Hmm, let's just skip a couple. Here we are migrating, going across a river. <laughs> it's a little scary. Oh, didn't I just, oh. oh yeah, this one I want to show you. So you can see this child is in a cauldron, like a kettle, <laughs> riding on the reindeer, and um, they take their stove, and they take their pans, and, and their clothes, and just everything. They pack it all up, and four times a year they do that. John? How often do they move? Four times a year, every season. Unless the pasture is not good, and then they have to, uh, sometimes, especially in the Gobi, they might move more than that. That one year the government bought motorcycles for the people. This is what they did with them. They didn't last till the next year. <laughs> then this is, um, oh boy, I can tell I haven't been there in three years. Anyway, he's uh, taking a chainsaw and they're going to go cut wood. And here's when they're coming back from bringing the wood that they burn. And it's large, it's quite heavy, I guess, and dense. Then uh, before, in the, in the Soviet time, which was before 1990, they, they used to sell antlers, blood antlers, or velvet antlers, to Russia and China. And that, that really was harmful to the reindeer. So we, then we, uh, my friend Dan Plumley, who lives in New York, started a project where the people could, we would give them knives and different things so they could carve the antlers and then uh, sell them to tourists. I brought some here. Here's one. So then that person I showed you in the beginning, Salanga, the musician, she, uh, when she flunked out of school, her mother apologized to me and her mother gave me this reindeer and this reindeer is named Sass, but it's a male. <laughs> and here I am when that reindeer grew up. And uh, this Orna, she lived, she was in the movie. And then this is when I did my first book, and I took it back to show the people. And uh, this woman was so excited. All these people are reindeer herders. They were in the city of Olambatur. And then the book, he's on the front of the book, Jinjik, and God bought his mom. So then uh, one year we were riding back to uh, the, get our plane, and the car got stuck in the river, and we had to climb out. I tell that whole story in my latest book, so it'd be, it, it's, uh, oh, wait a minute. Then it, it stayed there for three weeks, and it didn't work anymore. Yeah. Can't imagine. Yeah, and this is a reindeer. Okay, so um, do you have any questions about that? Yes. Do the reindeer ever just not stand up when they're being when they're too overloaded? I haven't really seen that. I guess they know them pretty well how much they can take. 
but uh, that one that I was riding on that they named Sass, that one was not trained to give somebody a ride, so it's a little tippy, you know. <laughs> that one was more a pack animal. Yes? I have a question around the language. Oh, yeah. Yeah, do, um, how, how do you communicate? Do they speak English? Do you speak, I don't know what speak. Okay, everybody in Mongolia speaks Mongolian because everybody goes to school. Um, the kids actually go to boarding school. They board in town uh, when their parents are up herding the animals. Although a lot more parents are moving into town so they can connect with them and take care of them. Um, they, so everyone speaks Mongolian. The Mongolian reindeer herders speak also Tuvin, Duha, and their parents and grandparents speak it, but they haven't really learned it as well. But I think they understand it. That's their native language. Because they are the smallest ethnic group in Mongolia, the Duha reindeer herders. So you speak Mongolian? Um, I always have a translator with me. I speak some Mongolian. But since I'm usually making movies, I want to make sure I really get it right away, what they say. And, uh, you know, to ask more questions and sure. things. So I, I do have a translator and assistant. You know, you really need an assistant with you if you're in Mongolia anyway, because the culture is so different. You can make mistakes right and left. Yeah. You know, and even though I've been there 19 times now, I still <coughs> have to have somebody with me to say, um, don't touch that, but uh, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Did, oh, yeah. Oh, what, what is their diet? Oh yeah, I was going to talk about that. So the diet is mostly their, what they get from animals, milk and meat, right? Dairy and meat. They have hardly any vegetables, they have no greens, they, um, they, um, they sometimes have root vegetables, but not the reindeer herders, and flour. So it's meat, dairy, and flour products, like they make noodles, they make, uh, bread, they, all those kind of things. That's what they live on. And they have to import the flour. Yeah, they have to carry their bags up on the reindeer up to the taiga. Yes? Uh, does the shaman, uh, does he or she, is, it, is that strictly male or strictly, okay, so do they get their medicinal herbal things from the, the plains there? Or do they have to import drugs from Russia or China? Okay, well, let's, um, there are different ways of um, medicine in Mongolia. They do have Western medicine too. Um, and the second thing is traditional Mongolian medicine. That's where they import herbs and have traditional doctors. That's what I studied for uh, in Mongolia. And the third one, the reindeer herders use, which is they know the plants and they use their own plants. There's one <coughs> plant for respiratory issues there's one plant for throat. They, they know the plants and they have their own system of um, what they use for that. And they hang them and dry them. Um, you can see that in some of the other movies that they have one called a Vonsen roll, which is very important. Um, <clears throat> it, had, it, it looks almost like rhubarb, but it has a, a beautiful head to it. And, um, that's a very sacred plant that they use for all kinds of healing. And how do they determine who will be a shaman? Is it one of the, they elect them, or does the person just come with certain gifts they're born with? Usually it's, they get the shaman disease, which is, I have another movie on shamanism, it's called Ceremony. And, um, and so they get a disease. One, it could be they have epilepsy, or it could be they have mental illness, or it could be they just can't focus, they just can't do what other people can do. They wander through the night or through the forest or whatever. And so what they do uh, is they take them to someone else and they say, what's the matter with this person? And the, the person is either a Buddhist Lama or another shaman. And that person says, oh, that's the shaman disease. This person needs to begin to be a shaman. Hmm. Yeah, Don. Uh, where do they uh, brush their teeth, go to the bathroom, or oh, clean themselves, in the river or what? We're talking about outside. I, I don't know. <laughs> I was wondering, okay, no. Um, 
in in most of Mongolia they have outhouses and things. In, in the taiga they don't. They it, because they have trees and things. They they have two. They have slot toilets, which is they're about this a little thing around you, three sided, with two boards to stand on and a very sh ch narrow or shallow hole, and that's where you go. Is it outside or is outside? Thing or? Everything is outside. And you brush your teeth outside, you just step out and brush your teeth. You can spit anywhere you want. <laughs> yes? Uh, what about genetics? Are, is there intermarriage uh, between, in families? I mean, how do they handle that, keeping uh, the, the genetics? Uh, traditionally, the um, the what people say is they know, they know. They have a very clear idea of their lineage, oh. and they really keep track of that to make sure that um, they can marry a certain person. Oh. But in the taiga, because there are not that many people that know how to live that way, they often do marry people that are somehow related. So I haven't seen any big problems, but some people say there are, but yes. When they're moving four times a year, what are they seeking each time that they move? They're moving for pasture land for their animals. So it, so the place that they leave, what happens to that pasture land? Does it get depleted or? Um, or yeah, it gets renewed. renewed. It gets renewed. Okay. You know, just by being left alone. And the reindeer also, we're just talking about reindeer right now, but they need to be in a cold place. So they go up to a higher altitude because they're very uncomfortable when it gets hot. In the Gobi, they they travel, they migrate um, in, a, in a linear way just to where there's more grass. But in the taiga, they do it in a, an altitude in this way. Yes? How about water, drinking water? Water is always challenging, especially in the, in the Gobi. Um, <clears throat> Up in, in the taiga, they always boil their water because uh, it's always from the river. And um, the taiga, mostly all around, el everywhere else around Mongolia except the Gobi, they're where they can get water near a river. They settle. And in the Gobi, I think they settle near a spring. Um, but sometimes they have to have it uh, in a tanker come to, to for them. Yes. Uh, so do the reindeer um, in this country, are there any large predators like um, wolves or bears that would prey them? So they have to have the reindeer herders with guns or big okay. dogs or something to protect the herd? They have a lot of dogs and the, the word is if you hear the dogs barking at night, you know they have to go check because the wolves are around. Okay. And they have a lot of wolves in the north. Um, I, have, I don't know about bears killing reindeer. I haven't ever heard of that. Um, but they, are, they have bears, and, they have, and the wolves are the real danger. But in the winter, the, the wolves can't move as quickly as the reindeer, so they're safer. Mm -hmm. But at night, um, <clears throat> you know, I've been sleeping in that settlement, and you hear the dogs, and you know you're surrounded by wolves. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? What is the um, temperature span oh, yeah. from, you know, not cold to hot. Or okay, the Gobi, no matter, these people are amazing because the Gobi, it goes to minus 40 to 100 oh. or more. And in the taiga, it's usually cold um, and it's below zero a lot of the time. Like probably this week, it's in the single digits at night there. You know, it's just cold all the time and uh, they I don't know how they do it but they do yes well, what about life expectancy yeah it's about 60 65 68 for the men and women I'm not sure I don't have the they don't have records for the taiga people which might be a little bit lower but I did look that up recently for the country yes um, so nomadic life is kind of um, traditional way of living. Yes. So I'm like wondering to what extent they're like 
moving to modernism, or as I like modernism impacting the way they live? Wait, I can't really hear you too well. I should stand away from the machine. <laughs> so, like, uh, the way they live is in more of a traditional living? Yeah. And I'm wondering how, like, to what extent the modernism is affecting the way they live. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, uh, Can you repeat the question? The question is, uh, how uh, do they have modern life, the nomadic herders, right? They, they know about nomadic life because they have a 95% literacy rate in Mongolia, so all those kids have been in school. And they know about modern life, and they choose what works for them. But their key is to live the way their ancestors lived with their reindeer. So whatever they can do that way, like if they bring in solar panels, they're fine with that. If, and batteries, if they have a television, they're fine with that, with a chainsaw. And now they all have cell phones. Mm -hmm. So it, they're, they're really, you know, they're aware of modern life and they've chosen this kind of lifestyle. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. And in the city, I just let me put it th th this way because I don't want you to think the whole of Mongolia is like this. They are more modern than we are in Vermont. Just be, just to be clear about this. Yes. So when a Mongolian woman gets pregnant, um, she probably doesn't go like a monthly visits. She probably has other women in the village there that know how to midwife. Well. Uh, that's the thing that the Soviets did, because the Soviets were setting up uh, socialism in uh, Mongolia from 1920 to 1990. They built hospitals in all the little counties, and so the women generally go to the county center to have their babies. I've talked, what? I've heard of some who've had their baby right there, you know, have the baby and back to work, but um, mostly they, they do. In fact, in my movie, which I didn't bring copy, but it's online, um, Gobi Women's Song, there is a birth in that, in the Gobi, one of the women. Yes? Can you say some, more about the cultural practices? When you, had, you said you always had to be careful. Like, oh, yeah, the taboos and things? Yeah. Okay, when you walk in the door, when, from the south, you walk into the door of the, of the gare or the orts, you have to go to the left, and there are two poles that hold it up. You can't touch those. The, you can't, the fire is really sacred, so you don't touch that. You can't step on the hearth. You know, there's a, a board which you have to step over. If you touch that, that's not good. If you, uh, what else? Um, oh, you can't go near the altar or touch the altar. You can't walk over, I mean, people are all on the ground, you know, they're all sitting around, but you can't step over anyone. Um, you can't touch people's heads. There are just a lot of uh, parts that are really important, that it, but it takes a while to get those, and you really need somebody to say, ooh, that's one, you know, but yeah. So it's really important to just keep focused um, and, and respectful about that. Yes? When you said their, their water is always a problem and water was trucked in, are there roads? I mean, how, okay, do those, okay. how do those trucks I was talking in? about the Gobi for that, Okay. for the water trucked in. Um, water, I, I was just thinking about, when I said that, I was thinking about one year we were at the East Taiga and um, the water was yellow. I mean yellow, bright yellow. And fortunately, by that time, I mean, in the beginning, we had to boil everything, but by that time, they have these filters, you know, that you can, you can just use the filter, and they're 99, they take out 99.9% .9 of everything that's bad, and it changed the color of the water. When you put the yellow in here, it would come out clear, so. Um, but I think that is related to climate change that they couldn't stay as long in that settlement because the water was not uh, able to keep them uh, supplied. So they had to move a little bit earlier than usual that year. Yes? In the, in the taiga, how many different groups are there? Uh, in the taiga, how many different groups are there? Um, well, there's the east taiga and the west taiga. 
and a lot of them are related. You know, the, and they even are related a little bit to each other, but they're quite far apart uh, geographically. In the East Taiga, mostly that whole, there are 21 orcs or teepees, and sometimes they're in one group, and sometimes one of them goes up, way up to that northern one that I showed you that's up near Russia. In the West Taiga, they are smaller family groups. They, they might be with their brother or sister or their parents or something, so they're only about mm, two or three orcs in an area, maybe five. And then you, you ride for an hour and you get to the next one. You know, they're in different directions. So are there two nomadic settlements in the whole region then? West Not really. They, that's that's what they call it, but you know, it's actually a group of people: West Taiga, East Taiga. Those are the names. That's what people call it. Of the yeah. cluster of people. Yeah, and the West Taiga is much more loosely. They, they don't move together all the time. The East Taiga is a little bit more in touch with each other, and they're closer to the settlement. That's another thing about tourists, you know, because the tourists are there, the East Taiga gets a lot of benefits from the tourists. Like, you go out to visit, you hire a reindeer or a horse or something, and you have them make food for you. And so, you know, that also begins to change the lifestyle. Okay, now I want to show you a movie about the Gobi. And um, this, uh, uh, okay. Um, I need a password, Chris. I got it. Yep. Okay, so this is called this is called Gobi Children's Song, and we made it um, over uh, COVID. My uh, editor edited it, and um, we went to make another movie called Transition, which was with the Taiga people up in, up north. But while we were there, we went to the Gobi to visit this girl named Nara, who we've brought over four times for. Um, because she was severely burned. And so we brought her to Shriners four times, and they always want to see us when we go there. And so we went to visit them and had the cameraman with me, the translator, and my grandson, who did the sound. And, um, and we stayed there uh, a few days, and this is their life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Kapitän Bertu. Thank you. 
Pas nous beaucoup.
questions do you have? John. Ownership. Is there any sense of ownership? Who owns the animals? Who owns the housing and the stoves? There's no private uh, land, okay? Yes. And the rest, they own everything. But do they own it jointly, or do they own individuals or families? Families own it. Families own different sheep, different? Yeah. That's why they put the collar on the horn of the, of the goat, because that's to say, this is mine. The, um, I noticed the refrigeration device, the yellow one, the right on the TV. Do they normally set that for freezing temperatures or refrigerators? I think they use that the the yellow block for refrigeration uh, if they have electricity. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe they use it for storage sometimes if they don't have electricity. Yes? What does schooling look like for the children in the Tega? Oh, Priscilla, I didn't know you were here. I'm embarrassed that you <laughs> You know, Vermont Public wouldn't show this. They censored it because of the killing the animal. Um, but that's their life. Um, yeah, yeah, and if you eat meat, it's your life too. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, their schooling, they go uh, when they're seven now. When I first started going to Mongolia, they went later when they were eight or so, but now they go six or seven, and they go for... 12 years, say, public school. Um, they go into the Sum Center, it's called the, the village center or the county center where the schools are and they're boarding schools for the, the kids. That was the way it was when I first went to Mongolia, but now a lot of the parents can see the necessity of being around their kids to support them while they're in school. And they, uh, like in the Taiga, they have a, a gear in the village so that or or a little house so that they can one of the parents can live there with them and in the gobi they've moved into the village also to be near their kids but the schooling um you know the style is sort of remote uh, rope you know it's not really it, it's more like a russian kind of way of education yes do they uh, keep wild horses or camels they get the meat from those or is it? They get meat from all their animals. Um, yeah, mostly the sheep and goats. Yes, over here, did someone have one? Oh, okay. I just want to run through my notes just to make sure I, I uh, covered everything. Uh, I wrote, all nomads have a home that's movable, not a lot of things, because you can carry them with you, no plumbing. Sometimes they have electricity. They all have one space, you know, it's about this big for the whole family. They line up on the floor to sleep at night, and every day they close up all their bedding and put it around the outside to use, like we use for hay bales for the insulation. Um, <clears throat> obviously, they're really connected to nature. This is a good thing, and it's really difficult sometimes if you're a Westerner because they don't plan anything. You know, they know that anything could change at any moment. So if I would want, and, and their time is different too. So it's very challenging to be a Westerner going and uh, dealing with that. Um, I don't know if you noticed that even in the Gobi, some people had clothes covering everything, all of their bodies, because, and they, I find that really interesting. Even when it's 100 degrees, they, they do that. And in the taiga, they usually cover, have, they have traditional clothes. Um, some of the people had them on in the movies. Oh, I thought you might be interested. Animals generally don't get names, except for reindeer and dogs. Uh, let's see. This is kind of interesting. Everyone in Mongolia is a descendant of a nomad because 100 years ago, everyone in Mongolia was a nomad. Mm -hmm. um, and you could see some remnants of it in the city just by the way they set up their apartments. Like my assistant, Anuka, um, 
who just got an apartment for the first time in the city. She lived up in the, the taiga. And uh, the whole, her, she doesn't have any furniture. The whole space is open. And she treats it just like a gear, you know, so that they can use the whole space and they don't really need as much space as we do. Um, and sometimes the clothing has a little hint of their, their background, but uh, it's changed a lot in the, in the 30 years I've been going. It, it, almost everyone used to wear the Mongolian den, which is, um, you know, a, like a gown kind of thing. And now they, almost everyone has modern clothes. But in the winter, and riding a horse, you do wear Dell because it, it fits the, what you're trying to do. And it, it's a really cool kind of uh, piece of clothing because it has, the material goes from here all the way around and it overlaps in the front. So when you're riding a horse, you can still have your, both your legs covered because you can open it that way. And then it has that big belt, and you can make a pocket. It makes a pocket in the top, so you can carry babies or lambs or cameras or anything you want. In it. Yes. What about footwear? I only saw plastic shoes. Yeah. What about boots? Hmm? What about boots and leather shoes and stuff? Yeah. In um, in the taiga, they all wear boots. I mean, mostly in Mongolia, people wear almost. So, um, cap high le black leather boots and in the taiga they wear them all the time you know if it's if it's really hot they use flip-flops but basically uh, every day they wear those. and these are store-bought boots yeah yep maybe some are bought are made in Mongolia maybe by hand but so the children go to school for 12 years, and after going to a modern type of school, what are the percentage of them that want to come out and go back to their nomadic type of life that their parents are doing, or their grandparents? Well, the farther you get out, like with the Taiga people, they go to a school that everyone there is is a, a, a living sort of subsistently. And I don't know if that's a word, but um, they, they can move out from there. Um, and they they do go back, um, but if they go to college, it's or the university, it's a um, it, you know I think it's very good if they move out to the countryside again, like Selena, that singer. I was just so touched that she would want to help countryside children because there's a big divergence between the city and the countryside, and as far as what opportunities the kids have and the people have. In the Gobi, how many different places does a, a nomadic family have? Just two? Uh, in the Gobi, as far as settlements, they don't really need anything where they go. You know, this is their, when we saw uh, Nara's family, that was, um, I would say that's their main encampment. But if they had to go to another pasture, they might not have anything there. It might just be land. So they may not move throughout the year. Yeah, they, they would take their gear, and they would take their motorcycle and their animals. How many spots do they have they go to? Um, <clears throat> normally, they have about four. Uh, traditionally, um, they used to move every six weeks. Um, and <laughs> it varies from one place to another. But I think almost all nomads still move at least for each season to a Is different that place. like not the growing season in that film is hard because they didn't really see much food It's never the growing growing season there. Oh, okay. That's what why the, they don't eat fruits and vegetables. What the animals do? The animals, about the animals. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, one of my friends who uh, was a sheep herder said, and what do they eat? <laughs> <laughs> like there's just a little bit of something growing in that uh, gravelly <clears throat> land that they eat, and that's why they have to move them. And also, that's why they have to take the, the truck out with the water, because they have to have them different, you know, the horses were over here, the cat, uh, camels were here, the sheep and goats were here, because there wasn't enough forage for all those to get together. Yes? I'm curious how they hunt. 
since they have to move so much, how do they cluster all the animals? Do dogs help herd them, or how does that work? That's a good question. You know, sometimes they use a motorcycle to, uh, for, to bring the sheep and goats back in. You know, because they bring them in at night often and put them in that corral to save them from animals, wolves and, and all. Um, how else do they do it? Yeah, they, they uh, even up in the taiga, not in the taiga, but that area, they use motorcycles sometimes, or horses to, to bring the other ones in. Do any of their dogs assist in herding? Hmm. I know the dogs protect the animals. I'm not, I haven't, that, there was one dog in there that's a really hot, well-known Mongolian dog, a Bangor, and they do herd. I don't, I haven't seen dogs actually herd. Maybe I missed it or something. Okay, anything else? I have, okay, I have two books. Um, one is, I wrote a while ago, I think I brought it. Um, I didn't get it out. Oh, yeah. This is, this is my first book, Reindeer Herders in My Heart, and I wrote it about 10 years ago. It tells a lot of stories about my experiences from 2003 to 2010, working with the reindeer herders. And this is my um, latest book. It just came out last month. It's called Marrying Mongolia. It's about um, having too many relationships and marriages and finally deciding on Mongolia that that was good for me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so if you, if these are for sale if you want one. And thank you so much for coming. It was great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.